Hello, uh, good afternoon uh, from Geneva. I am Mirek Dushek uh, with the World Economic Forum. A warm welcome uh, to all of you uh, on Toppling for this uh, session entitled uh, An Insight, an Idea with uh, Yossi Vardi uh, and Dana uh, Al Alami, two amazing people and very interesting personalities that uh, I've had the pleasure to meet and to work with as part of my uh, responsibilities here at the World Economic Forum. Um, so a warm welcome first, uh, Yossi and Dana. Hello. Um, for our uh, participants uh, to know, of course, a reminder that uh, this session is uh, part of the Pioneers of Change Summit of the World Economic Forum that is happening uh, this week and where we really focus on the trailblazers, the people that have uh, been breaking new ground uh, around pivotal issues that have been implementing important positive change in their environs, uh, bringing a lot of people with them, sometimes ahead of their times and sometimes with uh, heavy headwinds. And I think it's quite poignant or symptomatic that we have uh, uh, two people, uh, one representing uh, the Palestinian society, another representing the Israeli society uh, that are here with us today, speaking of headwinds and, and challenging um, environs. Uh, so, with Dana and with Yossi, we'll have 30 minutes together. It will be a conversation, and I'm really looking forward to uh, looking under the hood of how you've been driving change in your career so far, but also uh, what's your outlook um, going forward. So, first, let me introduce you, because I think uh, it will already give us a very interesting start. Uh, if I could start with you, Yossi, I have known you now for 13 years, so I still vividly remember uh, meeting you in, uh, in, in Tel Aviv uh, on my first visit uh, there. And I've, of course, benefited tremendously, so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, um, uh, I think your story is really uh, so, uh, again, symptomatic of Israel. Uh, you have a lot of superlatives in your CV. Uh, and people can read about you on Wikipedia. What kind of stuck with me is that you were the youngest the director general of a ministry when you were in your 20s. Uh, you at that before already you set up a company and then you sold it. Uh, you were part of the negotiations in the 1990s of the peace negotiations on many fronts. Um, you are an important VC, so you, you've been uh, the embodiment of the startup nation, if you will. Uh, you had a really important exit uh, of ICQ then to AOL, which many people think was really the, uh, the, 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 the big moment for the Israel ecosystem to realize, and you inspired many in Israel to go down uh, your path. Um, uh, but you're also someone who is very involved socially. Uh, you're working a lot on inclusion, uh, and um, you are also someone who is very active internationally, uh, working with startups around the world. So creating these movements of startups with your different colleagues in Italy, in Barcelona. Uh, I could I could uh, go on. Um, and Dana, you are. The, the, the founding curator of the East Jerusalem hub of the Global Shapers. Um, and so, of course, this is part of the network of the Global Shapers of the World Economic Forum. Uh, but you are a social leader and you are very, uh, you are very committed uh, to, to your society. And I think this is a testament to your commitment. You're also someone who is heavily involved in digital in Palestine. So you are uh, I think you co-founded and you are the director of operation of Intersect, which is a, an entrepreneurship hub in Ramallah, uh, which, is, which is looking at, at fintech and at other technologies uh, and how, how, they can, uh, how they can take off really um, in Palestine. 
uh, and and you, I think you did that when you were 24. So you're you're you're, you're like you'll see uh, starting uh, very early at, a, at an earlier age. So really a, a big a big uh, a big and warm welcome to all of you. And I'd like to start the conversation with uh, with you, Yossi, uh, around the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem of Israel. Uh, of course, some people could say, OK, uh, we all know it. We've read the Startup Nation book and it's well documented. But I still think it would be good to uh, to see from your perspective what have been the ingredients of success for the Israeli innovation ecosystem. So looking to the past a little bit and spending some time, but also to the future, because I think knowing you and others in Israel, you don't want to be rest, resting on your laurels. So what is it that is going to be driving the innovation axis uh, for Israel going forward? Over to you, uh, Yossi. <coughs> OK, uh, thank you for this uh, <laughs> very embarrassing uh, opening. I need to book you to my funeral, so please write the date down. And I hope to see you there. And I will ask you to repeat it. Uh, you know, I look on the three of us, I think that Dana represent the future, Mirek, you represent the present, the present, and I re represent the past. But nevertheless, uh, let, me, let me try to, to answer you uh, with a twist. I think that the status of the high tech in Israel is by now, it's a very well known story. Uh, we have flow stream of visitors to Israel every day. You have here visitors from industry, from government, from companies, from startups, from investors, trying to figure what, what do we give to our young people to what we put in the water or what we give them to smoke. And, uh, and uh, by now, I think there is, there is an agreement that this is a mixture of uh, of support of the industry by the government, by a very active VC ecosystem, etc. But more important and very elusive and very tricky is the culture, the culture of innovation, the culture, the culture and the and the and the heritage. The Israeli kids are being pushed by their very aggressive mothers from the age of six to go and accomplish all the things that those mothers ex expected from their husband, which failed to deliver and they want to relieve it from the kids. So at home, you are being taught that you are going to school and you better come back with at least one Nobel Prize. So you have this uh, very active culture, but I want to mention something, something which is very important that while the digital economy create a lot of benefit, benefits, it act as an anti-equalizer in the society. These benefits split the society to two parts, to a smaller part which benefit, and bigger part which is seeking to get into it but un unable. In Israel, about 10% of the population of the labor force is engaged in the high tech, and this is the highest number in the world but 90% are not part of it. And, uh, and therefore there is a growing awareness of the industry on the role the industry should play in, in wider inclusion. It's both a moral obligation, but also self-interest. You know, if we are not going to do it, we are going to be a group of small kind of digital uh, oligarchs who are totally uh, not connected to the to the to the real world, and this cannot be, especially in the time Corona. The Corona is coloring the, this difference in very strong colors and weakening the weak elements of society. So this thing, which I call radical inclusion, which means how we bring all fragments of society into the game, is very very important. Uh, I would love to uh, go into more detail on, on what you're doing 
on this radical inclusion idea to just demonstrate a little bit to our participants uh, some of the things you've been doing for decades now, which I think are important. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to have a follow-up question to you more on the business side. Looking forward, uh, as you look at, uh, you still, I think, are an active VC, unless you've uh, stopped in the past few months. So uh, on the business side, what do you think are the, 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 the sectors that Israel should be focusing on um, in terms of innovation, or are we just, are we just uh, remaining uh, with what's been going on? You know, I'm, I'm, uh, this year will be my 51st year since I created my first company, which I created in 69. So now it's 51 year. And what I, the most important thing I learned through these years, that the idea and the sector are not important. What is important is the execution. And to get good execution, there is only one component, and this is the quality of the people. So I, uh, when I invest, I'm not focusing on the sector. Sure, I don't, I don't like to invest in sectors which I don't understand anything. You know, even when I invest in sectors which I think I understand, half of my investments are going sour, you know. But, uh, but so at least I try to do things which I, I cheating myself that I understand. But I know one thing, if you have people which are number one, very talented, top talented, top talent is essential and it's a great asset. Number two, personal virtues. Personal virtue are the top of top importance. You want people who are good, who are dedicated, who are humble, who are not controlled by their ego and, uh, and uh, ethical and can collaborate with other people. And the third thing, which is very important, is the passion, the enthusiasm, which drive the thing. So when I invest, I look for people with these three things and the rest will follow. And even if I find them sometime, maybe 5%, I disappoint with my choices and 50% the investment is not going anywhere. Thanks. Uh, Dana, if I could go to you, um, I've been traveling to, 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 to Palestine, to Ramallah and, and other places now also for, I think, 13 years, uh, same time. Um, and so I've always been thinking that this is, uh, this is a very thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. I've been also uh, seeing a lot of uh, entrepreneurs uh, that were able to then uh, enlarge their activities and are based in between Ramallah and Dubai, for example, and, and really are able, have been able to grow their companies into regional, uh, regional actors and players. Um, and I, I think it's just one of those ecosystems which is still in a stealth mode to uh, a lot of the people in the global audience uh, or, or among the global participants that we have today on the line. And so if you were to describe the digital Palestinian, the Palestinian digital ecosystem uh, for the participants that are interested, how would you describe it? Thank you so much, uh, Merrick, and for the introduction previously. Yossi, I just wanted to touch on one point that you mentioned. You said that, you know, you represent the past, Merrick, a present, and I'm the future. And without the experts, um, you know, there will be no future. And I think it disconnects me to how interested I am in the title of this session, you know, an insight, an idea, because us, the future generation, will gather all these insights from you guys, and then we will translate it into the future and how to execute it. Um, and one of my professors actually from the past once told me, um, it's when you talk about your work that you understand what you're actually doing. And I think these summits and these you know, everything, the initiatives that WEF is doing is allowing us to understand how to execute these insights into action for the future. Um, Merrick, to answer your question, first, I'd like to clarify that I'm paying particular attention not to use the word ecosystem to define the Palestinian tech scene yet, um, because it's important to know that it's still in its early stage um, compared to the Israeli or other ecosystems around the world. It's definitely very unique. Um, it is fragmented, but it's maturing. Um, I'm just gonna give you a bit of an overview of the situation in Palestine. So it's a population of 
1.25 million people with a 97% literacy rate. And each year we have around 34,000 university graduates um, of which 2,500 studied engineering and IT. So as you can see, it's a tremendously educated population. However, um, you know, the unemployment rate um, of, of these graduates is 50% and half of these students are women. You know, so we're talking about a very young population where 30% is under the age of 25. And I'm one of them, I'm 25, and I spent a fortune on my education in leading international centers of innovation in London, Tokyo, New York. And, you know, I put an investment that would have taken me 30 years to pay with an average salary in Palestine. Yet, I still struggled to find a job six months after graduation. So uh, this is when I decided to create my own. And when I talk about the startup ecosystem, I'm talking from personal experience of someone who had to create their business. Um, and I became founder of an innovation hub in Palestine with a mandate to build and empower uh, this innovation ecosystem and support the startup scene. Um, and one of the challenges we found while building the foundation for this business is that there's no pipeline in Palestine. So we tried to create one, connecting with one of the biggest VCs in Palestine. Um, and our vision was to work with early stage startups, incubate them until they are ready for acceleration and funding. And one of the biggest questions we kept coming back to while building this foundation is, what do you do with a highly educated population? And while we were trying to answer this very general question, we constantly had in mind, you know, in addition to this global pandemic, the political situation and the economic constraints um, in Palestine make it a very hard scene and, you know, very tough for startups to flourish. Um, but for me, you know, I see it that despite the struggle and despite these challenges, this generation of a Palestinian youth, the future generation, shows really great will and enthusiasm and is determined to push the economy forward um, in order to improve the quality of life, um, of their daily life. So it becomes personal at this point and it changes the narration and it changes the energy of these entrepreneurs. I see that they are very skilled. This gives me great optimism and I see a huge opportunity to advance. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. So kind of shifting gears to what, uh, what um... Uh, and by the way, I'd love for you to be in the bracket with Dana. I, I feel like I'm also the future. If you, Dana, if you would have, me. <laughs> please accept me there. Uh, so uh, 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 just on the uh, because Yossi, you mentioned radical inclusion. You mentioned uh, uh, how important it is that we really think about also the people that are not yet part of the digital economy, if you will, are not directly benefiting from the high tech um, uh, uh, growth that we see. Uh, so if I could start with you, Dana, on that, how do you see it in Palestine uh, that how, how do, let's say, traditional businesses uh, and, uh, and, and, and other sectors of society, how, how, do you have any ideas or what are you doing to make sure that they're not left behind and that we're not feeding this divide? between the digital haves and the digital have-nots, uh, to, 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 to use uh, Yossi's uh, phrase. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Yossi mentioned a very good point about inclusion. And I think when we talk about insights for innovation and, in, and execution, we really have to understand the local market and the needs for the application. So, you know, when we talk about the Great Reset, we talk about jobs of tomorrow that are very technologically enabled indeed. However, they're also very human centered. And so when I talk about the Palestinian ecosystem, I think of a very traditional one, one where there's a lot of heritage. And I think in order to apply the Great Reset ideology, we have to find a balance um, in order to avoid the risk of cutting a great deal of jobs and traditional crafts. Um, so for me, it's all about balancing automation with craftsmanship, a herbalization where one, one isn't sacrificed for the other. And as a designer, I will ask this question of how might we use technology to enhance and empower these businesses rather than replace them. Um, yet, on the other hand, on the other extreme, um, it is also important to encourage Palestinian entrepreneurs towards the creation of new jobs using technology and innovation in response to the gaps in the market um, and to tackle the issue of unemployment I touched upon uh, previously. Um, you know, because I think many of the IT grads who do not find jobs in Palestine tend to find jobs in the Gulf where, you know, the competition is high um, or get employed in outsourcing jobs in multinational companies. 
but I still see it as an advantage point because these candidates come back with very high skills and transfer these skills um, into a better and stronger ecosystem in Palestine. Therefore, they then become the pioneers of change. No, thank you so much. Very nicely put. And just very quickly, if I could follow up, I said that you are also the founder or the co-founder, founder, sorry, a founding curator of the, of the East Jerusalem Hub. Uh, so can you tell us a little more about uh, what that Global Shapers Hub is doing in, uh, in, in Palestinian society? Just yeah. to, uh, just to uh, uh, continue on that. And then I would like to go to you, Yossi, on the same question of, the, of inclusion and what you're doing with your activities there. So Dana, if you can just uh, uh, address that. Absolutely. So, you know, I said uh, I'm, I'm a strong believer in the power of youth, and I definitely think that it is time for young leadership to take over. Um, so when we launched the hub, we decided with WEF that we will launch East and West Jerusalem hubs. And now there are four hubs in Palestine. Um, and for me, that's a way for us as Palestinians to empower the ecosystem and force ourselves in the national agenda. So that's the first step for us. And I think one of the initiatives that we try to do is collaborate with the four hubs in Palestine, um, you know, and, and try to be connected also with the hubs around the world so that we can be, we can network more and have more collaboration. Um, one of the most outstanding uh, initiatives that we did as a collaboration with the four hubs is um, a conference that we managed to create in 21 days and it was a dream for many. Um, but this conference, you know, we had thousands of people coming. It was a great networking, networking opportunity. And there were many uh, startups and founders that talked about this experience. But we also had change makers, leaders, and politicians in this uh, conference. And this was a, change, a chance for us to bring, you know, business and politics in order to, to, to make some sort of change in Palestine and the ideologies. Um, another area that we try to tap into, other than business and politics, is mentorship and education. Because I believe that when we collaborate as youth and we make all these initiatives together, you know, we start to start, we start preparing the next generation through education, and we can then implement these ideologies in school rather than just focusing on supporting adult entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, um, I, I see a huge potential for that. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you, Dana. So Yossi, um, shifting to you and on what you're doing, uh, particularly with the with, with quote unquote the schools, because I have I have uh, visited and and I think it's a tremendous project. Could you please talk about that a little in a little more detail? Uh, uh, it, it's around the radical inclusion idea, but this is a de uh, this is a, a practical demonstration of it. Okay. Before that, I just would like to add one word to support what Dana, what Dana said. Uh, I live maybe half an hour from Palestine to go from my home to the nearest uh, Palestinian point is less than half an hour. And uh, because of my interest, I'm quite aware of what's going on in the high tech in Palestine. And also many American, in Israel, we have many American and European companies which are located in Israel. and in recent years, they began to contract Palestinian youngsters to work for them. And so you have companies like Intel and Nvidia and Microsoft and uh, Nokia and uh, and then Cisco, the best of the best, employing young Palestinians. And they are peop the, the 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 people, the the executive of these companies, don't stop to brag about the both the quality and the commitment of the young people. And this is probably one of the best kept secrets of the region. Uh, I see we have quite a nice turn turnout in this meeting. So I call all the people who see the, the meeting. If you are looking for good, good fresh source of, uh, of coders, look into Palestine. You will be surprised, but uh, I know that there are over a hundred international companies and regional companies which are contracting there. So this was just a little testimonial to support uh, to support Dana. Regarding the, the, the inclusion, the, the problem in society, this is a long topic, but I will try to summarize it. In one minute. 
<laughs> in, one, in one minute. The, the problem is that people have different narratives. To so the same set of facts, people have different narratives and they, they develop the narratives while they suck their mother milk. So you leave home after 18 years of being bombarded directly and indirectly with the narrative. And every, everyone is right in his narrative from his point of view. What, uh, and then the, 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 the examples are endless. And you can argue until you are blue in the face whose narrative is correct and you, ne you never have a chance to convince what you should do regarding the, 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 this, con this issue of narratives. You have to agree with the other party that you cannot agree on the narratives, but you have to respect the right of the other party to have his own narrative. You don't, you don't have to accept it. You have to accept the fact that he has the right to have his own narrative, like you have the right to have your own narrative. What you should have, you should number one, have empathy. And number two, you should focus on how to develop the shared future. If you take this approach, you can arrive into understanding. It's not easy to arrive in, into understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding uh, the, the schools, you know, in Israel, the society is fragmented to number what we call tribes. Uh, you have the, the secular Jews, you have the ultra-Orthodox Jews, you have the, the secular Arabs, you have the religious Arabs, you have the Bedouins, you have uh, Ethiopians, uh, you have uh, Muslims, you have Christians, you have any, like, we are like a catalog of uh, everything. And, uh, and different people who come from different backgrounds have different chance to succeed in life. The main, the, main, the main problem is not of the bright kids. The main problem is for kids who are coming from challenging social economic Mm -hmm. a background and uh, I spent together with some of my friends in the in the high tech and uh, some uh, some international foundations supporting schools which serve the kid we are not focusing on the brightest kid we are not necessarily focusing not that we don't like them but we think that a kid who who is accomplish less still have a chance to do a lot of great things according to his capacity and we are trying to empower them and we get uh, amazing results you know we go to a school and in five years uh, kids are getting average kids get, getting the top top amazing. results in, in in matriculation exams uh, when we have two hours I can deep, uh, give you all the yeah all the details, but I, I must say that uh, as all of the people who are involved in this kind of things, we are not doing anybody a favor other than ourselves. It really gives you a lot of good feeling about all the sins you have done in the past. So this is a way maybe to be redeemed a little bit. No, Yossi, thanks so much. I can attest to how great these schools are. I, I, I visited with you in Ragozin and also in Lot, and uh, it's just amazing what you're doing there. Um, we have uh, about, if they allow me to go a little over, maybe three, four minutes. And uh, uh, I'd like to stay with you, Yossi. Um, obviously, I touched upon it at the beginning. We also have the political frame. So uh, just to be, just to be uh, front that the World Economic Forum has been um, always a big supporter of the two-state solution. Uh, and we have been work, uh, working always hard to make sure our platform is provided to a forward-looking yeah, dialogue on that issue. So you are part, Yossi, of a community we've had since 2012. No, uh, that since, is since 94, if you don't and, mind. And before 94, of course. So can you tell us a little more on yeah. that? And why do you think, why are you engaged in, 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 in this dialogue well, between the Israelis and the Palestinians? First of all, this is a great opportunity for me to thank the forum for an amazing job it has done since 94, which very few people are aware of it. But since 1994, the forum was very active in creating a meeting ground between Israeli and, and Middle Eastern uh, 
people, business people, leaders, academia, etc., etc. From the Israeli side, the uh, uh, late President Peres usually spearheaded this effort. I was lucky enough, you know, to, to be involved in it. And uh, the first, the, actually the first business meeting, the first meeting between Israeli business people and Arab business people, uh, open one was that it took place in Morocco in the MENA meeting that the forum, as for the forum, never saved any effort to create this these uh, opportunities, this, uh, this ability to, to meet and in, uh, in places like Cairo, Jordan, and even now everybody talk about the Gulf, but uh, people don't remember that in 97, I think, the forum got a big delegation of uh, Israelis and uh, regional uh, Arab people to Qatar and we had our first meeting in the in the Gulf. This is the time to say really thank you and this bring me to my my maybe my conclusion sentence you know this meeting uh, is about ideas so the one idea which I would like to suggest I I saw first hand the great effect of people meeting other people and talking you know when you talk the suspicion goes away you develop understanding you develop compassion you develop empathy you develop trust it's very important today according to wikipedia there are 53 armed conflicts around the world and probably a few hundreds non-armed conflict I think that they, this model that the, that the forum uh, employed under the leadership of Klaus and with the very active participation of Bourget and yourself, Mirek, is a very good proof of concept. And I, I would like to suggest to the forum to do it in all these 53 conflicts to get business people from the two sides of the fault line uh, to talk. We know as a fact that both in South Africa and in Ireland, the business community played a very important role in solving the conflict. The business community cannot sign a peace agreement, but they can give tailwind and, uh, and the feeling of uh, security to the leaders. So my one idea for that meeting and for this wonderful conference is let's take this model that we employed in the Middle East and, uh, and, uh, and use it in other places. It takes time, it, it, you have to be uh, stubborn, you, you don't have to, to, you have not to leave it, but I think that the, the, the ice was broken to a great part on the people to people level by the forum and this model should be employed in other, line, in other fault lines as well. No, thank you, Jose. I'll make sure to also transmit it to, to Klaus Schwab and Borge Brande. And uh, thank you for your commitment. I know Klaus Schwab uh, also is very proud of, the, of our role uh, the, the, in South Africa at the time. And, and uh, this is a great idea. And I thank you for articulating it like that uh, for us. Um, speaking of ideas, uh, Dana, I'd like to you to wrap us up with your idea what would you like to to know to note as one idea that you would like to give as a farewell to the participants here uh, for this session yeah um, um i think i'm just going to build on yossi's open call to solve a challenge but mine is a bit more um brief i'd say um i look at a challenge as a design challenge and i uh, this is an open call for other global leaders um to reflect reimagine and reset their systems um so i'm going to give you a set of steps and if you follow it you can definitely be creative on how to involve it in your system and solve a challenge so the first step would be to identify a challenge whether it was covid or climate change or anything because insights and ideas fuel innovation and then practice observing and interpreting and ask yourself what do people need on a national and global level and practice the what why how of observation of experts um, 
you know, and then you, you also you mentioned empathy multiple times, and I insist on this one. I think you know you really have to use empathy. Get beyond your assumptions. Put yourself in the shoes of, of the people you're designing for or leading. And um, last for least, interview. Ask the right questions. Set the stage, and then you can uh, share compelling and quality insights that will inspire others um, to make a change and innovate. Um, and I think these are the main steps for creating solutions. Um, and before I end, I just want to share one quote um, from Zahi Khouri, which you both know. Uh, he's a Palestinian businessman and an active member of the World Economic Forum. He always says that diamonds are created under tremendous pressure and Palestine has mines full of diamonds. Um, so I think all these global challenges should not be a limitation to anyone, but rather flourish under these challenges and solve and innovate. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love uh, that can-do hopeful message uh, as, a, as a farewell from this session. Uh, uh, thank you so much to all of you on Toppling. Uh, this was uh, an insight and idea with Yossi Vardi and Dana Al-Alami.